mentioned our thing this year is being rooted in Jesus and everything we talk about, all that we do, we're really trying to drive home this, this idea that in order to experience the best life possible, we need to be rooted in the one who could give us the best life possible here and now. And that's Jesus. And so this year, everything we do is going to be focused on driving that point home. And today, we really, really want to take our attention, like, okay, throughout the year, okay, we understand that different people in different places in life. And so our goal and our hope is to address and deal with and give you things that are going to help you wherever you are in your life. Some of you have children. Some of you don't. Some people are married, no children. Some people are grandparents and have grandchildren. Uh, some are not married at all different people in different places. And so we, we understand that not everyone's in the same place. Today, we want to focus our attention specifically on our families with children, but it doesn't mean that if you do not have children, this is something that you cannot gain from or learn uh, from. And so uh, we hope that you'll listen attentively to these things as we say them, because uh, there, there are issues. Uh, there are real struggles when it comes to raising families when, when it comes to raising up our children in any society. And uh, things don't necessarily seem like they ever get any better, do they? They oftentimes feel like they get, they get worse. But uh, my personal perspective is that, no, things are the way that they've always been. Uh, the challenges are still there. This, they may look a little different, but uh, nothing really has changed. What may have changed is our intentionality, our willingness to engage uh, with the, the faith walk of our own children. And uh, for a long time, I think that uh, maybe we just expected our Bible class teachers, our, our ministers, our pastors, our church to raise our children for us. And uh, that's not necessarily, that is not the way that things should be. We, as a father, I am the primary caregiver for my children. I am responsible for their for, for, their, for their livelihood. I'm responsible for molding and shaping and, 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 and helping them be successful in this life. And I know that I cannot do that alone. And I have to start with Jesus as my guide. But I also rely upon my faith family. I rely upon friends. I rely upon uh, ministers to help equip. And, uh, uh, because this is something. This is something that is a huge challenge uh, for all of us. And in reality, it is, a, it is a, a, a better experience when it is a community experience. And so this morning, we're really focused on helping our, our families, our parents, to become a little bit more engaged and intentional about uh, being involved in the faith walk of the children and getting them rooted in Jesus. But here's the deal. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter the resources that we give you. It doesn't matter the amount of conferences you attend doesn't matter the amount of books that you read. I, I suggest to you that it's all going to be for naught if you don't start first on your knees. If you, if you are not in prayer, if you're not seeking God's guidance in prayer when it comes to raising your... If you're not praying for your children, and I'm talking about the, the, the serious, deep, internal changes that need to take place... No amount of resources are going to help. We have to first get on our knees, and we have to be in prayer. And we've got to spend time, and we've got to be in desperation, pleading on our knees on behalf of our children, as we talked about last week. And if you weren't here last week, you check the website. The message will be online. It's all about us getting on our knees and praying to God, the same prayer that Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus, that we will be strengthened with with power in our inner being through his spirit so that we can understand and be rooted in Jesus and grasp things that are beyond knowledge. And this idea of being rooted in Jesus has to first start with us on our knees on behalf of our children. That being said, this morning you're going to be able to listen to or hear uh, from our children's minister and our youth minister about some things that they're passionate about. They're going to speak into uh, these very things that we're talking about here and helping to uh, equip you uh, as parents. And so as we focus our attention on being rooted in Jesus, and this morning specifically with our children, we hope that you'll pay special attention to the things that are being said because this is a huge challenge. And don't, 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 don't overlook okay, the necessity 
of the things that we're talking about this morning. And so as we get started, we ask that you watch this video. I want to see them treasure the Lord. I want to see them find their joy and everything in Him. I didn't know how to lead them into that. I just felt overwhelmed. The most challenging part of being a single mom is probably being stretched so thin. There is a lot of give and take when there's not a second parent. And I don't have backup. I sit there and I think that, have I failed my family? Did I not take them to church enough? Did, you know, did I not get them plugged in enough? You know, who's going to influence them? Are they going to stay grounded in the things that we've taught them? Really, I want them to have faith in their life. Maybe that's my job to do so, and I'm going to try my hardest, but I need help. We started getting out of control and just partied and drugged. And what we found out is, until you're in this mess, you don't know anything. One of the things I want to implement in my family is just faith. I grew up in a home where going to church and prayer and all those things were just not important. We didn't do those things. Anybody ever feel the struggles that some of those parents in that video were expressing? I remember as a parent wondering if, I'm, if I was doing it right, if I was doing enough. I wanted my daughter to grow up to be a faithful Christian. Thankfully, she is. Another one of those prayers God answered. This is a partnership. Um, a children's minister is one person. A youth minister is one person. And we can't do this all by ourselves. Children's spiritual formation takes all of us. Parents, children's ministers, youth ministers, and the church. So I'm going to be talking about some of that today. The reality is that our kids are in school about 30 hours a week. Another 30 hours a week they may be watching TV or playing video games or connecting on social media. So I want you to think about that in comparison to the amount of time that your children are spending with God during the week. Are they spending another 30 hours with God during the week? My guess is no. So what we want to do is um, work on how we can increase our time uh, our, as a family um, and how we're going to spend more time with God. And that's why we have to do this partnering together so that we can root our children in the Lord. And Nolan and I are really more of a resource than we are anything. And a lot of people think we just plan fun things. And we do plan fun things. We're, we're working on making good memories for kids at church. But we're also working on their spiritual development. And here's some ways that I think we can partner together to make this happen. First of all, faith is caught more than it is taught. We need godly examples. If your own spiritual relationship with God is not in the right place, then you've got to work on getting it in the right place. So that's our number one thing we have to do. Number two, our children need to be connected to a church family. Connect is one of our core values here at North Point, and I want our kids to learn that church is more than just something we come to. Church is who we are and what we do together to love each other, to grow in Jesus. Um, we often have, you know, every year when we have new babies, we, we have a, a baby blessing, kind of like we did today, but we call all the babies up and put their picture on the screen, and then we couldn't get all these people up here today, so we made a different uh, kind of blessing today, and I want to ask you as a parent just to recommit in your heart. I want to ask you as a church to recommit in your heart the commitments you have made to help raise these children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. So bringing them to church is a key element in that. Children need a church family. Families need a plan. You as parents need to decide how you're going to help your kids grow spiritually. And, you know, we all have a plan for our kids. You know, we, th we think some of our kids are going to grow up to be star athletes because they're wonderful soccer players, or maybe they're going to be a great musician someday. And we spend all this countless hours getting them the training to do that. So how many hours are we spending giving them the training they need to grow up to be the Christian that we want them to be? Um, 
to help us do that, I've come up with a couple of things. One is every parent today gets this book called 52 Creative Family Time Experiences. This is a devotional book, and it has at least once a week Devo time for you. So my challenge to you as parents is to set aside some time every week to do a devotional in here. In the back of the book, it has um, even holiday devotional times. Mother Day, Mother's Day is coming up. There's one in here on Mother's Day. So just so you'll know that, look in the back of the book. Um, for our third, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, um, I have a little book called May uh, faith be with you. Since we kind of kicked off our year this year with our back to school blessing is May the Force be with you, which was God. Um, I saw that book and thought, oh, this is perfect. When our children get to be in third, fourth, and fifth grades, we, we um, um, focus a little bit more in some very specific things to help them grow spiritually. We have uh, children's um, uh, excuse me, kids roadmap in the summer, which is a time where our kids go and pray over people and places in the city. To do that, they spend a lot of time in Bible study and in prayer to prepare for that. We have our collide retreat in the spring, and that is totally focused on spiritual growth. We have VBS coming up, and that is another time where kids learn more Bible stories, where they make good connections, Summer camp is an awesome time for our kids to connect. If you don't bring your kids, they can't connect. If you don't encourage your kids to be a part of whatever it is we're doing, they won't connect as well. And what we want them to do is connect really well when they are younger in elementary school so that when they get to middle school and high school, they're already going to have those bonds and those friends, and they're going to want to be here. They're going to want to come. Because if you don't incorporate that into them the whole time, then there's a good chance they're not going to feel comfortable doing it and they're going to back out and not want to come. So we don't want that for them. So as a family, make a plan. Uh, make a plan to have devotional time. Make a plan to encourage your kids to be here for the things that will help them grow spiritually and the things that will help them connect and have fun. You know, that starts from day one. Um, when, we, when, you're, when your baby is born, we have cradle roll class here. Bringing them to Bible class is essential for their spiritual growth. People think babies can't learn. That's not true. Our babies are learning um, about God's love. They're learning about God's creation. They're learning how to say the word Bible. In toddler class, they're looking in their Bibles, and they're finding a picture of baby Jesus in their Bibles. So we're very serious and very intentional about teaching our children in Bible classes. Our curriculum goes from the Old Testament to the New Testament in um, three-year repeats. So they're repeated every three years so that we're grounding them, rooting them in some Bible knowledge. Okay, so... Um, as you think about this plan, think about ways, number one, you can change your relationship with God to make it be what it needs to be. Number two, your children need a church family. Number three, um, make getting them here a priority. I want to just say that... Um, it takes about 48 volunteers to run our Sunday morning Bible class children's worship. Excuse me. It takes 80 volunteers to run our Bible class children's worship in a year's time. I have about 48 volunteers. I don't have enough volunteers, so something you can do as a church is to help in some way. I have some volunteers that are doing six months and nine month stretches, and my children's worship teachers go all year long. They're only teaching once a month, but they're doing it, and some of these people have been doing it and doing it and doing it for years. What I want to avoid is our volunteers burning out, um, so I would like some more volunteers, and um, I need that with VBS coming up. I need people to check children in out here, which is a very simple thing to do so that we keep our kids safe. So as you're thinking about things you can do um, to help root the children in the Lord here, to see that they're, they're 
made to feel a part of this church family, then please think about a way that you can volunteer. And last but not least, and Adam has said this uh, already this morning, and that is pray for your children. I could not have um, been a parent without the power of prayer, and um, that's what I want um, for you to recognize and do. Now, um, I have these books out here in the back, and after church, you can come sign for those. And if you're visiting with us today, we want to be sure that you get one if you want one of these. If you're a grandparent and want one of these, um, we'll try and get you one. In case if we run out, we'll just order some more. So um, thank you for the time that you've given me today. I just want you to know that I love being your children's minister. There's nothing that makes me more happy than to see a child who has grown up in our children's ministry here give their lives to Jesus and I got to witness that last Wednesday night when Audrey Fox was baptized and that's a very happy time and that's what I want for all of your kids. Well high school ministry was a lot of fun. It was a lot easier to follow God because my community was doing the same. All my friends would go there. Um, I was in the worship band. I was this kind of picture-perfect youth group kid. We had a huge youth group. I got to find people that were very similar to me. It was my home. It was my favorite place to be. Well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna fall away. Like that's the last thing I'm gonna do. You know, look at my family, look where I come from, look at the church that I come from. You know, that's the last thing. Faith is central to me. Like that bubble burst within months. College felt really lonely. To come to a place that's so far away from everything familiar made me feel very alone and made me feel very insecure. I joined a sorority right when I got to college because I knew that I wanted to make friends. Because I had so much freedom, I really lost all my motivation for school. Students everywhere were under the influence or had drugs or alcohol with them at school and I was really surprised and not prepared for that. I kind of wanted to try it, not gonna lie. I started drinking, I like started partying, I started caring about like what people thought of me a lot, wanting to be skinny, wanting to wear clothes that showed more than probably should have. It turned out to be a lot harder to stay sober than I thought. I ended up compromising my own values, my own beliefs, and ended up getting involved sexually with, with girls. Any sense of identity that I was getting from God, I had replaced with this romantic relationship. Losing something that was central to me, which was my virginity. I just, man, that decimated, you know, the rest of the stuff I could I could get back, I could heal from, you know, I could like I could turn around and get away from. But that's something that's, you know, you can't change that. Uh, and so that just makes it impossible then for me to ever live up to that ideal that I had placed upon myself and that was placed upon me coming into college. My relationship with God was messed up. I didn't really want anything to do with a personal relationship with God because I felt threatened by it and I felt like I would be condemned. My best friends who I was a roommate with called me out and said, dude, this isn't you. You just get to a point where it gets to be very, um, you achieve very low self-esteem. I'm making decisions here that are hurting myself and hurting other people and I didn't think myself capable of doing those things. And it wasn't until I needed God's grace that I realized God had been there the whole time just with his hand extended and all I needed to do was turn around and, and grab it. I kept straying away from him over and over and over and every single time he still received me back into his arms and he's the only one in the universe that would do that. So, real quick, if everybody in here could raise your hand, if you remember uh, being a teenager, um, if you could raise your hand if you were influenced by anything. Okay, cool. So, about everybody is influenced by something. Um, just like these teens in that video, um, a lot of that was at my school. And for those of you who don't know me, I went to Abilene Christian University. Uh, it's a Bible school. 
there was sex, there were drugs, there's alcohol all over that place. There's really no way possible to shelter our students from the world. And so that's, that's why I chose Sticky Faith. I believe Sticky Faith is that resource, or one of, of many, um, to develop this, this calling that's deeper than what Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter can give us. Um, and so Dr. Kara Powell uh, said this. Um, she says, Sticky Faith is a book or a resource uh, that presents a way to live in the world, but not of the world, so that when our kids fail, not if they fail, but when they do fail, they have something that they can remember why they studied for 18 years um, that they can come back to. And so in the youth ministry world, there's a, there's a term going around uh, that's called a dry cleaner parent. And, and that's a parent who comes and drops their kid off for the hour or so that they're with the youth minister, and they expect to come back in that hour and pick up a completely new, clean child. And who did the cleaning? Right, the youth minister, the youth worker, somebody pairing up with the teen. Um, and that, that's not what we want. That's not what we want to develop. We want to erase that mindset, and we want to work together with the parents. We don't, um, we don't want to, like Adam and Beverly had said, we are not the primary religious factor in your kids' lives. That should be you. That should be the parent. And, and so that's, that's what we want. We want you guys to get these resources so that you, you don't become a dry cleaner parent, that you stay involved and you say, okay, my, my kid is not doing what he or she should be doing. I'm going to go talk to them instead of, hey, youth minister, what are you doing? You're doing something totally wrong. My kid is uh, doing this, and you're not helping. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do anything unless you tell me. Uh, so I'm, my job is not to uh, clean your kids and send them back to you for that week to, to come back again Sunday or Wednesday completely dirty. Um, but instead, we want to help with you. So Sticky Faith is going to just be that resource that's going to build a faith uh, that lasts. I sort of identify with these people because um, in Sticky Faith research, about 40 to 60 percent of students drop out of church when they graduate high school. But it's not as bad as you think. 30 percent do come back, but that's still not a high enough number, if you get what I'm saying. I was one of those kids who dropped out. Yes, I went for youth ministry. Yes, I went to a Bible school. Um, but I didn't go to church for the most of my freshman year of college. And I deeply regret it. Uh, but I moved to a new town. I moved, I had to uh, build new relationships. I had to find new friends, find a new church. And if you've ever been in Abilene, there's at least a thousand churches on every corner. So it's hard to choose one. Um, but I went to one, which was a mega church. And I, I came from the Church of Christ in Lubbock. And it was, it was rather big. Um, but this place was a huge mega church. For Abilene, it was maybe 3,000, 4,000 people, um, which is just a normal church, I guess, in DFW. But I, I hated it. I couldn't connect. I didn't know where to go. Um, and so I, I just stopped. My roommate didn't go to church, so I thought to myself, I don't want to wake him up, so I'll just sleep in. And, and I figured, you know, I'll get my chapel credits. I'll get my church credits when I go to chapel or when I have Bible class. That's not really how it works because you miss out on a lot. Um, but I did come back. And I didn't just come back because, because I wanted to. It was, I was called back. I was called back to the church. I felt guilty every Sunday that I would wake up at like 11 o'clock. But I was one of those 30 percenters that came back because I remember what my parents had taught me. I remember why I was living. I remember for those first 18 years, I remember why I got baptized in the sixth grade. I remember why I hated getting grounded from youth group. I remember why I wanted to believe in Christ. And that's what brought me back to church. And that's what we're doing with Sticky Faith, is we want your kids to see the world. We want them to think, but we also want them to remember that they're 
their faith is not a jacket that they can take on and off and throw it in the corner, but it's something that sticks, and that's why it's called sticky faith. Um, but my senior year, my parents were coming through Abilene because they were going to go on vacation without me, as they always do. And they were coming back on the way, uh, back to Lubbock. So they stopped, and we all had dinner. And everybody, my sisters and my mom all went to the restroom. And so it was just me and my dad sitting at the table watching basketball. And, and so for my dad to stop watching basketball was a big deal. But he, he told me, he said, hey, Nolan, I'm proud of you. And I'm the first of their children to graduate college, and I knew he wasn't proud of me for that. But he said, Nolan, I'm proud, he is proud of me for that. But he said, Nolan, I'm proud of you because, yeah, you, you've done so many things in your life right now, and you're only 21, 22 years old. But you developed your own faith. You left your mom's and, and my faith, and you developed your own. And, and we're really proud of you for that. And so, for my dad to tell me that he was proud of me, I knew he was proud of me, but for him to tell me he was proud of me because I left their faith and I developed my own was a huge deal. And I, and I really do pray that every single one of you feels that way if you haven't. Because, um, man, that, it's so much more effective uh, than just having your old man tell you he's proud of you in the first place. Uh, but because you're a grown man or woman uh, and you develop your own faith, there's really not much that can beat that. And so that's what we want to do with Sticky Faith. So um, I hope you guys understand your kids are going to be influenced just like you were. Um, but don't, don't shelter them from it. Don't, don't let the influences win out. I want you guys to, to read the Sticky Faith. There's a guide for the parents that I'm going to be giving out uh, in the hallway after the service. I've already given the kids one. Uh, for themselves to read, uh, but I want you guys to study as a family and figure out um, how to help your teens because they're going to be influenced. There's already Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, and Snapchat's a thing you guys can't check on, so that's just something between the kids and whatever, and you know what? It's going to happen, so it just depends on what kind of faith that you build in your students um, that'll defeat these influences and let God be the influence. So I'm just going to leave with that, and we'll be in the back. Uh, visiting, please come get one. Don't feel like you have to let the members go. We'll get the members one. So if you're visiting and you want one, please come get it. Thank you. Let's thank uh, Beverly and Nolan for uh, the attention they've given us. This idea is, is something really big for me, and not just because I have children myself, but because I was a child, like all of you, um, but what happened in my life between the time that I was a baby to the time that I was 13 was instrumental in helping me uh, essentially come back to faith, you know, we're looking 12, 13 years after I turned 15. Um, whenever my eyes were open to the fact that there has to be a better way <laughs> to live. The thing that bought me there had to do, and it was, it was all about how I was raised. And I was raised going to a church with a family who believed it was not perfect, although people thought we were. And we, we as a family, would read and we would study. Um, I think at one point, I think I was 12, and I'm not going to tell you what I got caught doing, but uh, my punishment that summer was to write the New Testament, and that's what I did. Well, half of it anyway, and uh, I was good enough to get out of that, but uh, that was a part of our lives is the point, and the, the things that I experienced as a result of our faith and as a result of how we were raised, at least for a certain period of time, was a huge part of why I am here today. And those of you who know at least parts of my story, hopefully can see how much of an impact and how important that this really is.